Welcome back, friends. We're in studio today, and we're having a great time, and we're learning a lot, and we're actually here today with a friend of mine, Brian Kendrick. Brian is highly intelligent. He's figured out a lot of things about life, and he's overcome a lot of life's adversities. You know, oftentimes we hear stories of people saying, you know, hey, I did this, I did that, and now I'm here. But we don't often understand how they got there. It seems like it's so easy for them, but we don't realize the challenges and the tribulations that the person went through. Brian, great to have you in the studio today. Thank you. It's, it's so good honor. to have you. Yeah, it's great to be here. So let's talk because I know a little bit about your story, and I'd like you to share it with our audience because I think that what you've been able to do is quite profound. And I think that we can talk about it from the end result, but I think people need to know how you got there. So, you know, begin where you want to begin. Well, I, I, I talk about what it was like, where I came from, because, you know, if I shared too much about what I'm doing now, sometimes it sounds like bragging. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about myself, I want people to know it carries a message that if I can do it, you can do it. Because uh, two years ago, I was homeless. I lived in the streets of Chicago. I struggled with addiction my entire life from, from a very young age, probably 14 or 15 is when I started drinking. And it just spiraled on to multiple felonies in and out of prison and ended up, my last 10 years, uh, ended up with heroin addiction. And that, that was my drug of choice. That was my solution. That was what I was willing to sell my soul for. Um, it turned me into a parasite. And that's why I'm always telling people that if you don't hate yourself, you hate your actions. And the beautiful thing about actions is as humans, we could change our actions at any given time. But I did things for this drug uh, that made me loathe myself. And of course, I couldn't escape myself. And the only time that I had any hope, I, I, I was chasing hope in a bag of dope. You know, it gave me two or three hours where it wouldn't matter if I was in an alley or what I was doing. I had a feeling that everything was going to be okay. That was my solution. And I really, truly, honestly believe that I hated myself. I didn't find until I got into recovery that that wasn't the case. My inner, my true self, who I was as a person, wasn't what I hated. It was the things I was doing for this drug. Um... I can tell you that everywhere that drugs could possibly take a human being, they took me. I was homicidal, suicidal, and I took people with me. I took hostages because I've always had the gift of gab, mm -hmm. and I uh, used that. Because, and it wasn't even bad intentions. I, I never set out to be a bad person, but my selfishness, ego, edging God out, I was so, stuck in such a selfish state that everybody became ways and means for me to get more, and I used them, you know, and that and. Even my own daughter, my own mother, uh, my attempts at loving them because I didn't love myself. Even when I tried to love God, my hands were seeking, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, my, my bottom ended up in the streets of Chicago, Illinois. I had a girlfriend at the time, and we went there trying to run from a situation, and it just ended up spiraling and getting worse. Uh, we ended up homeless together on the streets. Um, I was on a suicide mission. I can remember one time toward the end of my drug career, uh, I was walking across this overpass that we always walked across. And as we walked across it, I was such a negative, parasitic, pessimistic person, I would talk about jumping off this bridge as we walked across it. And she would call me on it. And it she turned around and she said, you're not going to do it, and more or less called me a coward. And I promise you, I remember that moment. I almost jumped off that bridge, but she had a hundred something dollars in her pocket and the dope spot was just a couple blocks away. So in that scenario, that chase for that hope and that dope got me across that bridge. And then there is, you know, there wasn't one specific thing that happened mm -hmm. that made me wake up. There's a bunch of different things that happened. Um, she left me. I ended up realizing that my biggest fear was to be alone. My ego always told me I was such a popular, charming person that I would never have to face being alone. At the end of my path, my mother, who was my enabler, who I called and put through hell on earth, got involved with Al-Anon, which is a fellowship for addicts and out loved ones of addicts and alcoholics, mm -hmm. and she changed her number. I used to put my cell phone and my wallet in my shoe. Um, and then I would put my shoe under my head. I was sleeping on the streets. And I woke up. Somebody had got my shoes and my wallet, my dope, and, and my cell phone. And at that point, I was, I was shooting drugs uh, in my neck. And the only way to do that, you have to have a mirror. 
I, I couldn't just wing it. I had to get into some place, which was hard to do because I was such a nasty, filthy person that most places could recognize me as a junkie and wouldn't let me in. So now I don't even have shoes, even if I could get the dope to the cop. I called my mom. She had changed her number. And there was, there was one person that I grew up with um, I met in high school, Marty Norman, mm-hmm. um, who had two years uh, clean at the time. And I called him, and he sent some people to come get me from Chicago, Illinois. And then a bunch of other things. I still didn't get it. He, he brought me to Terre Haute, and I went to a sober living community for men, and I got a lot sicker than what I planned on doing. And my mother was coming to bring me clothes and money, and I called and told her I couldn't do sober living. I needed inpatient treatment. I called a friend of mine that was my go-to guy where I always went for drugs, told him to order up some drugs. I'd be there in like an hour. She called Marty. Marty told her, do not go get him. And she turned around, and I, I threw up hands and feet, went to sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, that friend who I was counting on to go stay with mm-hmm. had overdosed and died. Oh, wow. And then it goes even further from there. At three months clean, I moved in with Marty, and we was presented with an opportunity from a lady that Marty knew whose son had died of a drug overdose. She came to us and said, I will sell you this house at a reasonable price if you promise to do something for addicts. So at three months clean, Marty had two and a half years clean or so. Mm -hmm. That's why we were able to do it. But at three months clean, I I was put into human service. I had an opportunity to help others, and I'm so grateful that happened. Now we have two, and we're working on a third recovery home for men. Now I'm a certified recovery specialist. I've been on the dean's list. I'm in my second year of college, and I'm an outreach coordinator for a, a wonderful amazing treatment center and and I've just I've been blessed so I can't tell you one certain thing that happened it was Mm -hmm. a lot of different things that happened and I can't tell you if the Truman House hadn't happened would I still be clean I don't know I'm just very grateful that it happened that way when you when you did get clean and not that three months and you're giving back to people already you know could you even believe or identify yourself from the past you know when you look back into the past three months before six months before could you even believe where you were at that point in time well now that i've got distance after three months it was a process and it like i said i have a program and when i say a program i mean i have a a community and a fellowship around me i have mentors i have a sponsor i have teachers which is one of the things life had finally when when i woke up and found out that my friend had overdosed Mm -hmm. that was my moment of surrender where I finally said, okay, and, and I think I'd had more moments similar to that in life, but I never became teachable. My ego was always so big, and I don't mean I was puffed up, thought I was better than everybody. I mean, when I say ego, is when you're stuck in a selfish state that separates you from other humans, and you're not teachable, and you don't have connection, mm-hmm. and, and 12-step fellowship uh, that allowed me to get rid of some of the junk that was keeping me from connecting with other humans. So I became teachable, and I, I do 12-step fellowship. i done therapy. I go to church. I have a lot of mentors and a lot of teachers today. As, as I've went on this journey that's 22 months now, my inner circle has just been getting, getting better and bigger and stronger. And, you know, wise men seek wise counsel. And that is something that I live by. Um, they say that they can predict your future of your five closest friends. And I've been hearing that because I have an ab- addiction and an obsession with uh, motivational. I think motivational speakers and inspirational videos have been just as big a part of my recovery as all that other stuff. Uh, I mean, that is my new thing that I'm hooked on, to inspire people to become their greatest versions. And it's not just an addict thing. In a 12-step program, the only one that has anything to do with drugs and alcohol is that first one. You admit that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol and your life had become unmanageable. Well, here's the catch. You could work that step one with people, with money, with shopping, with sex, with gambling, with anything that makes your life unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Anything that puts you, like I said, when I was an addict, uh, it wasn't a conscious thing, but I was constantly thinking about self. So there was no room for God's light to get in. I I, I couldn't receive it. Darkness and light can't occupy the same place at the same time. So there was no room for the spirit to get in. I had to get out of that selfishness that I was stuck in for my entire life. Wow, that's amazing. Let me ask you, when you're working with clients now and you're working with fellow people, 
what are some of the big red flags or some of the things that you remember that you did when you were in that state that kind of reminds you of that ego popping out? Some of the things that might be said or some actions that they do when they're first showing up to get sober. I love that. That's a good question right there. <laughs> Here's the thing. We, te- we got guys all the time. We have 18 residents right now. And this was told to me because I was worse at it than anybody. They come in and you're trying to tell them something and they say, I know. <laughs> no, no. What you need to do is forget everything that you knew because what you knew got you here. Start from scratch. It, uh, and a lot of them have tried recovery multiple times because it's unfortunate, but that's just a statistic. That's how I was in and out of treatment probably six times before I finally got it. So they come in and they've been in treatment before and you try to tell them something. I know. I know. No, you don't. You know, you know, and there's a lot of things in life, especially when it comes to spiritual principles and stuff that we teach in our program that you cannot intellectualize. You knowing is sometimes the enemy like gratitude, love, forgiveness. These are action words until you put action behind it. You're not going to understand it. Like I could sit here and I could I could just I'm pretty pretty good at writing and describing things and I could tell you all about when I pick up a weight and when I lift it and after I lift it so many times the blood rushes and the veins start to pump I could describe that and really you could almost literally feel it mm-hmm. but you're not going to know until you go and pick up that weight Exactly Wow that's pretty profound So let me ask you another thing too because I think that when people haven't found God when people haven't found spirituality um, I, I think that they sit there and they agree and they agree and they, oh yeah yeah yeah. But you know, but but what was that profound moment when you realized that it wasn't going through the motions anymore? That you had finally seen this other side and realized because I know what it was for me and I I know what the change was for me and I know what I went through. And sometimes you'll try to explain that to people and it's the yes yes okay whatever and some people will kind of laugh at it. But yeah. what was that moment kind of when you finally kind of got there and you realized and you go okay I can I can never go backwards. Well, it, and I'm, st- I'm going to tell you this. I don't think that I could never go backwards. I could tell you that if I moved to a new city and I didn't continue to go in meetings and stay of human service or have some kind of fellowship, that very soon I would start to get restless, irritable, and discontent. And as an addict or an alcoholic, if I remain restless, irritable, and discontent for too long of a time, that's going to be my solution because I get stuck in that egoic, poor me. Uh, this is what I want. This is what I need. We call it the parasite. It's kind of a joke of our more, more, always think thinking about self and that's how I am by nature by nature I'm extremely selfish by nature I'm not the kind of person you want in your inner circle the reason I am this way is because of a spiritual maintenance program that I do on a daily so and my spiritual thing here's the thing I had all these preconceived notions I I got saved when I was younger in a Baptist really indoctrinated church and I had all these preconceived notions I had a friend I was in a Christian band when I was younger and we got in a car wreck and he died and I developed this resentment toward uh, what I thought was God. Um, So in early recovery, I was seeking God. I was studying Buddhism. I was studying Hinduism. I was was looking for all of this stuff. But as my journey continued, it became more about subtracting all the lies that I believed about God and simplifying it. And there's some things, man, like I said, knowledge is the enemy. I don't try to explain God. And I tell you, I don't believe that you can hate God because I believe that God is love. You cannot hate love. Like I said, darkness and light can't occupy the same place at the same time. I believe that the devil or the parasite is in every every place in you in humanity we see it in politics we see it in race we see it in religions we see it in social classes it's it, it's a war strategy to divide separate and conquer mm-hmm. so anything that w- gives me the attitude that i'm right you're wrong therefore i can't receive nothing from you that is the enemy and sometimes i've got to simplify it right down to positive and negative my God is positive energy. My God is love. And sometimes, man, instead of explaining it, I just have to be love. You know, I I understand that I need forgiveness, so I forgive you. Mm-hmm. I understand that I need a lot from my higher power. And the only way that my higher power speaks to me is not some voice from the sky. It's through other people. Mm-hmm. And here's a catch, 22, man. My God speaks to me through people that my human nature doesn't even want to listen to. I run into people and, and I've got some kind of, well, I don't, I don't care for this person. I've learned through my spiritual practices that those are the people that I need to listen to the most. And I believe that we were all created in an image. So the way I treat other people is a way of worship 
worshiping my higher power. If I practice active listening, then I'm worshiping my God. So if I shut my eyes with these people that it's my nature not to like and just listen, wow, then, then I'll get something to be like, I'm so glad I did this. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I love talking with you, and I'd like us to do another interview, another meeting here soon, because I think that you can really impart some true knowledge to people, because I do think that a lot of people overthink it. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, too, it just seems so overwhelming to folks, because it they're is. looking for the answers, and they have all these questions, and it seems like nobody's got the answers. Yeah. So one last thing before we leave today that you would like to express to our viewers about, you know, just whatever. I mean, whatever you think is really important. Well, I really do believe that instead of a human looking for a spiritual experience, I am a spirit having a human experience. Go to Brian Kendrick Live on Facebook. Check my message out. It's not just to do with addiction or recovery. It's a human thing. It's a spiritual thing. And I believe there are many different sufferings in the world, but the solution is the same for all of them. Community, fellowship, and love. Never be silent about your struggles. Give your pain a voice. You're only one decision away from a new beginning and this you know there's so much rock bottom is a great place to build a foundation this could be the best day of the rest of your life you want to change find a way to make your worst moment your best moment that's the kind of stuff you're going to hear and of course we do it with humor this is a serious interview but we monday morning motivation at marty norman live we have a monday morning show at 9 a.m eastern time check us out man uh you want to be a part of the message you want to be a part of the fellowship we we use social media as a platform and uh if nobody's told you that they love you today i love you and i love you Thank I love you for you. having me. Thank you for coming in, Brian. I love it. I can't wait to see you again and have you back in the studio. Absolutely. You know, think about it. What if? What if we just had these images of division? What if we just thought that we saw people that were different color, different races, different creed, and we just think that they're way different from us? We build up these barriers in our head, in our minds, in our heart, and then we build up these barriers that are actual structural barriers away from people so that we cut ourselves away from the world. And what happens then? When we do that to each person, we're cutting ourselves away from ourselves. Yes. We're all connected to the whole. We're all spiritual beings. And just think about it. Why can't we be spiritual beings having this lifetime? in a human body that we kept and we decided to keep we picked it up maybe ourselves brian so great to have you i look forward to having our next meeting and in the meantime if you like this video please um, say that you like it and subscribe to the channel and comment on it the information on brian's show will be in the description below and in the meantime don't forget to live your true life are you currently in a toxic relationship and unsure what the next day will bring have you often wondered if there's more to life than this? Do you suffer from self-esteem issues that you've had since you were a young child? Have issues or have difficulty speaking with your family? Do you feel surrounded by self-centered people? Seems as though you're always giving and they're always taking. If you've answered yes to any of these questions, you need some answers. The 10-Day Challenge to Live Your True Life gives you the knowledge and techniques for creating boundaries in your life that help us to deal with family, as well as dealing with those narcissistic and toxic people in your life. It offers the insight into understanding and overcoming your self-esteem issues and to begin to see for the first time your amazing value. You owe it to yourself to find the power within you.